We are live. Uh, welcome to uh, the October fifth. Welcome to the October fifth Public Services Committee meeting. Um, Jenny, will you please call roll? Vice Mayor DeRosa. Here. Ms. Fox. Here. And Mr. Reiner. Here. Um, the minutes of May 4th, 2020 Public Services Committee meeting are on the agenda. May I have a motion to approve them? Do we have any uh, corrections to the meeting minutes uh, from the May 4th? Any thoughts? All right, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the May 4th uh, Public Service Committee meeting? So move. Second. Okay. Second. <laughs> Jenny, will you please call roll? Mr. Reiner. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, we're here to discuss mobility update. And uh, well, I know we had a great conversation on May 4th. So this is a follow up to that. And JM, um, will you be doing the presentation? All right. Take it away. Yes, thank you. Can everyone hear me OK and see my screen? OK. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an update on mobility initiatives happening in the city of Dublin. Let's see, let me click. Oh. Uh, this evening, we're gonna give you, we're gonna um, just provide you some background, remind you about the mobility study, how far we've come and what our uh, focus is with this study. We're gonna give you an update on the five mobility priority areas and each priority area will have the updates, we'll give you up um, next steps and then there'll be opportunity to pause for a second and just provide any feedback or input before we move on to the next priority area. Because as, um, as um, Council Member Fox said, it is a lot of material, so we wanna give you ample time to provide good uh, feedback. Background on the mobility study, this is the strategic plan for the city for innovative transportation network improvements. And this is really to support the community's needs, um, whether it be the workforce or residents here and visitors for that matter. This initiative began in 2017. If you recall, we had a very large public input workshop where we invited stakeholders from local and regional organizations to provide context and input on with the direction of the mobility study. From there, we were able to provide, uh, we're able to craft a vision and key objectives. And then in phase two, we were able to develop the priority areas to guide the mobility study, as well as an action plan to prioritize where we wanted to start. And this was all under the, um, the veil of the connected community theme that city council designated at that time. Phase three was focused on implementation of pilots for each strategic area, and we were able to look for and secure grant funding and sponsorship during this phase. And this teed us up for phase four, which is transitioning these pilots to full mobility programs. As a reminder, the key objectives are to, oh, to support economic development, to promote equitable access to mobility options in our community, and to expand those multimodal options. Through that, we'll achieve better public health with more active transportation. And we wanna focus on future growth and mixed use walkable developments while we can still preserve the character of Dublin that already exists. And so it's really about preparing for the future and accommodating what we have today. The mobility priority areas we begin with microtransit, which you would probably recognize as circulators and shuttles in the community. Shared micromobility, think about bike share and perhaps other micromobility uh, products like scooters that we've seen or we're familiar with. We're working on concepts for mobility hubs, and these would be opportunities to transfer between different uh, modes of, of transportation. We're also working on wayfinding and shared use paths. And this is a tremendous opportunity to increase accessibility, but also connect into the regional control network. And finally, we're working on completing smart streets. 
The first area that we want to focus on is microtransit. And moving forward, we're going to give an umbrella term to our services. Um, it will be known as the Dublin Connector moving forward. And we've worked with Cher and Nelson Igard on refining this program, but also as we look to relaunch service for the Senior Disabled Shuttle and uh, retooled our approach to workforce, we worked on a new branding theme for this, including a new logo, which you see on the screen, as well as other items that we'll cover a little bit later on in this section. It's really important to underline that this, that microtransit is to provide mobility independence for those aging in place in our community, as well as those with disabilities. It's important for the workforce side of things because we're providing those crucial last and first mile connections from CODA service to Dublin employers. And we are piloting a new approach to the service to better serve people with disabilities who both work and live in Dublin. So it's very exciting and we hope that it can be a model moving forward. Um, on this slide, I'm going to just tee it up for Ryan. Ryan's going to talk more about Share's response during the pandemic, but I want to let you know that we discontinued regular service of the Senior Disabled Shuttle, if you recall, back in March. And when we provided you an update, we weren't certain when we'd be able to resume those services. Well, I'm happy to share with you that we were able to resume last Thursday on October 1st. So we are resuming the Senior Disabled Shuttle services, and that's really a result of the guidance from the governor's office as he re, uh, removed restrictions on accessibility to senior care facilities. Um, what I want to underline here is that SHARE was a great partner and able to be flexible with how we use this service. We did check with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission to verify that we could use federal dollars to provide a delivery service, which Ryan will talk more about, and we were able to get that green light. So using our partners, uh, this was a great success story, success story, excuse me, and I'll hand it over to Ryan to talk more about what Cher did during this time. Thanks, JM. Um, I, don't, I don't think by any means it's what Cher did, but I'm very proud of the collaboration that happened between the City of Dublin, your planning department, the team at Cher, and, and our, the communities that we, we work with and serve. And so, um, like any transportation business in March, around March 17th, SHARE had a reduction in service of, of 96%. And we went back to the organizations we serve and said, what do you need now? And the thing that we heard was that while people can't leave, we need to be able to bring things to them. And so we all worked together. We, we were able to utilize the vehicle assets and professional drivers and software and tracking capabilities. But instead of moving people, we started moving things to those people. And we were doing weekly uh, grocery delivery trips to a number of senior homes. And I'm actually optimistic that that will be a part of the service that continues as we look at optimizing both people and the movement of things in the last mile all together in one network. Um, I'm very happy that the service has now started. We had nine seniors that rode today and we're helping individuals get back safely into the community. Great, thanks Ryan for that update. Oops. From our last meeting, we heard a lot of feedback about data and really drilling down on those key performance indicators. The memo has a much more has much more content in terms of the key performance indicators, but we wanted to throw a few of the uh, data points up here on the screen. Um, specifically, we have 211 unique riders. I know that was a question from last time. How many active riders do we have on the service? Um, we have uh, some other items that were interesting. Looking at the parking reduction that's freed up daily from the share service, um, we have data points for how much CO2 emissions are being diverted by using the service, uh, which means cleaner air, and also how many single occupancy vehicles are saved. So think about lower or less congestion on our roads because of the service. And we're tracking all of these data points. And this is a snapshot of the whole service from the beginning in phase three in 2018 to today. Um, so these numbers are reflected in the dashboard that we're also working on with you, which we'll talk about a little bit more. 
This is a heat map that gives you an idea of where are the drop-offs or where are the top destinations for the riders of microtransit. You'll begin to see that the AC Marriott is the first with 453 drop-offs. Walmart and Kroger follow that. But as you look at the map, you'll see that with the top destinations, there's definitely a clustering of where destinations are in our city. Around Tuttle Mall is a big one in Avondale. And then there are uh, Avery Square with the Giant Eagle and Kroger and some other retail amenities. Um, and then Bridge Park and Historic Dublin tend to be another cluster, as well as the Rec Center. I'm going to turn it over to Ryan for this, and he's going to talk more about some of the branding and trip planning upgrades that they have in store. So take it away, Ryan. Thanks. So we've learned a lot together over the last uh, almost two years now running this service, and we've been developing some updates into our technology. A lot of the dashboard data that you that JM was able to show uh, was an update into our product, and now the city of Dublin has direct access to all of that data in real time. We're working on an update to our rider application, which is going to make it even simpler to schedule rides, and it's also going to give the Dublin Connector branding featured prominently in the app and it's also going to allow us to give some branding to our destination partners like hyatt or walmart they'll be able to be featured in the app and so before the end of the year this version of the application will become available um, all of our current users will automatically get an update and then this will be a big push um, the other addition to this app is that we now have transit integration and so previously you had to pick your bus stop and you were scheduling from the, the final code to stop to your employer. Now the share mobility app will allow you to do complete journey planning where you start with your transit uh, first stop outside of the city all the way to your employer and it's one seamless trip. And so um, I'll look forward to sharing you with you in the next update uh, some usage numbers on this. Ryan, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. How, how easy is it for um, someone, for instance, can you explain exactly how this app works? Like if you um, say you live at a certain address, will it, and you're going to another address or another bus stop, will it automatically um, configure the bus that will take you the time or do you have to put all that in? No, it automatically populates that. So I'll, I'll walk you through the full rider experience. Okay. So if somebody right, learned about this from the news or social media or a friend, they would go to sharemobility.com slash Dublin and they'd create their account and they get an email in. We allow somebody to pick up the phone. They can email us ride scheduling. We know a lot of the riders don't use the mobile application. For the riders that are using the mobile application, they get an automated email that says you've now been invited to the Dublin organization where you can plan rides. And so you put in your starting address and your destination. If it's a workforce ride, you're picking from transit options and then choosing from a list of the employers that are added in the app. On the senior side, we allow them to choose from any address. So they can be living at home or they can live in a community. And then we have a limited number of destinations, 30 or 40, it's all of the popular ones, that they can choose from. And then we have time that they pick. And what this does is it starts to funnel them into more efficient routes. So we only have vehicles out when we have known demand. And the demand is in funneled so that we can pr provide more rides per hour. Great. That really helps because I don't think we understood how it worked. Okay, good. And all of the requests come in through our software and it automatically gets sent to our driver and the routes are automatically built for our driver. Good. Okay. Ryan, are you doing this with other uh, municipalities right now? Uh, we are starting to do more. Yeah. So we've got some initiatives going in the city of Monroe out in the Dayton area. We're doing this with RTA up in Cleveland and while it's very, very novel for Dublin to do it, I think other cities might be a couple of years behind still in adopting things like this. Um, we, we are starting to do more of it though. So I, I, I believe this will be a standard for cities. Any other in central Ohio? Um, oh, in central Ohio, you guys are the, the main one we're working with. Okay. I was just wondering what their, what their experience with app was, so, okay. Yeah, so. So when you 
$23 a ride. Does that include your overhead or is that the actual ride? Uh, how is that figured? It's all in. So we, t we calculate the hourly cost of rides divided by the number of rides given. Okay. Does that cover your overhead and your staffing and all the rest of it too? Correct. It does? Correct. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. And it also incorporates marketing costs. And it's important to note that those numbers are for the whole duration of this program. So in the early days, there were some very uh, inefficient numbers that we were getting. So as we continue to go on, we see we hope that number will improve. Right, because you were at like forty dollars a ride way back when it was really expensive. But the more riders you have, the less expensive it becomes. So that's the goal, right? Absolutely. Okay. All right, we'll let you go on. Ryan, uh, was there anything with branding with the vehicles? Yes. That you want to touch on. I, th I think that's interesting for this group to know. So we're starting to explore how we could use vehicles that are owned by the city of Dublin and have your branding on them, or how Share could provide dedicated vehicles with the Dublin Connector branding on it. I think it's a great opportunity, very visible in the community. And so we've provided some pricing and models of how that could work. And basically Share would staff the driver and the software technology and use use a vehicle we would just want to put a dash cam in it to track the driver's performance thanks ryan and on the city side we've been working with our fleet and with our um, risk management to make sure that we can uh, craft a lease deal or some sort of arrangement that would allow this to happen in the hopes of securing those branding opportunities but also driving down the cost of the operations So we'll continue on. From last meeting, we did touch on what were some of the um, efforts that we're doing as staff to reach out to the work, the workforce employers, but also the senior care facilities. We've been working with Share on uh, expectations for how we want that to happen. And we do that through customer engagement process maps. And those are included in the materials packet examples for each side. And the biggest takeaway for those is it was able to set expectations for both sides so we can work in lockstep in marketing efforts, but also increasing ridership efforts. As part of that, we did create an informational flyer, which was an easy tool for the, empl the employer side of things as we make that pitch, leaving them with a one pager and then following up with you know, how we can connect them for the mobility demands. And that has been a great coordinated effort between share and economic development. On the senior care facility side, we have the maps as well. We do regular check-ins to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of our senior care facilities. And we're working on creating a quarterly meeting with each representative from each community, or representative from each community rather. And we would treat that as sort of a you know, quarterly check-in, but also perhaps a workshop. We can talk about rider training and some other topics that will come up as you want to work on uh, as you want to recruit people to use micro transit services. We do want to note the challenges and what we see as the strengths of the service in the past several months have been a great experience in the sense of learning where the strengths and the challenges have been. First and foremost, the COVID-19 pandemic that severely cut a lot of the code of service to our community which had a ripple impact, a ripple effect on our services as well, at least with the ridership. With the limited code of service to Dublin, we are able to continue operating, but as we see more of that service returning, that will help our operations as well. Funding and grants, we were able to secure some grants last year. The 5310 funds are for the senior disabled side, and those have been great uh, for that program, particularly with the delivery services. We did win a uh, state grant for the workforce side, but that money was clawed back subsequent, subsequently when the governor announced budget cuts and we, that money was taken back. So that was um, a mixed bag. We are you know, we're proud of the work that we did, but we'll continue the efforts into 2021 and see if we can get more opportunities for funding. On the workforce side, connecting with the right person has been an ongoing challenge. And think about organizations, if it's the HR contact or if it's someone else in the C-suite, who is going to be the champion of this program and who is someone that can help uh, get it incorporated into the 
organization itself. So we've had some mixed success with that, but we'll continue to work at it. And it's something to take note of as we continue down this path. On that note, any reference to the term pilot has been very detrimental to our efforts to recruit more writers and organizations. So we've we've distanced ourselves and we've tried to get away from the term pilot as we look to secure the long-term sustainability of this program. It's to our benefit to focus on that and not to mention the word pilot. So I think that's a really good takeaway for us and also to share with other communities that are going uh, looking to provide microtransit. The strengths, uh, I have to say that the, the service has been very flexible and I think that speaks to the way that the contract is is constructed with SHARE, we're able to pivot resources easily to either uh, bolster the senior day of stable side or create that delivery service or pivot resources to focus on essential workers. So that's been a great experience in terms of working with SHARE and our community partners to make that happen. It underlines the potential for this to innovate, whether it be other mobility initiatives or within microtransit. We've touched on the dashboard and some other uh, tools that we're able to come out of this effort and we'll continue to look for other opportunities as in using our city vehicles for cost saving but also for branding. So we'll continue to work on that. It's been very inter interdisciplinary and collaborative and it's not just between city departments but I mean also on a regional scale. We've, uh, create, we've created great relationships with other counterparts and other municipalities as well as on the, you know, MORPC and some other regional program or uh, organizations. And I think that's extended a lot of opportunities and it's opened the door for us to continue looking for other grants or other ways that we can improve marketing. So I think that's been great and we wanna continue working on that. The data analytics dashboard is an exciting tool. And right now it's very, we're still tweaking it. It's internal use, but we are working on an, a public facing interface for that dashboard, which we could uh, put in our web, put on our website or use for other, um, other ways to inform the public and the decision makers how the program is, is is operating. I would I have to say the the strength of this program is the continued support from the Dublin community and from you all on City Council. The Dublin community has been great in terms of working with and understanding the mobility needs of the community and being able to adjust for that. But also the funding resources from City Council in terms of the CIP and working with us um, has been has been really, uh, I think, a strong point of this program. So it, it positions us well for grants in the future if we show that we're trailblazers, if we show that we're working on innovative solutions. I, so I, I do, do want to say thank you to you all and also the Dublin community for helping us with this program. I do want to provide you some regional transit updates before we take a pause and talk about next steps. The, probably the biggest one to bring to your attention is the Northwest Corridor Plan or the Link Us initiative. And that is done with the City of Columbus in partnership with CODA and MORPSI. Right now, the corridor is looking all the way to Dublin, but the focus area is from Broad Street to Bethel Road on the Old Tanger River Corridor. And that is something that it's a great start, but we want to see that focus area extended all the way to the Park and Ride in Bridge Park in Dublin. So we're continuing to engage with our counterparts in the city of Columbus to see if we can be included in more than just meetings. Um, so we're, we're continuing to engage with them. There may be opportunities on your end to see if you can engage with some of the stakeholders to see if Dublin can be at least taken, I don't wanna say taken more seriously, but so that we know we're here and we want to contribute to the corridor and be part of its improvement. So I think that's important to think about and we'll continue to spread that message with everybody. As we do think about the corridor, the whole scope is to look at the mobility system. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today. They're looking at what are some opportunities for high capacity transit and rapid transit? Are there technology solutions on this corridor that can be deployed? What are the bike and pet improvements that need to, be, that need to happen? And what are the land use changes or zoning recommendations that will happen as well? So that's something to think about, but I think it's a good conversation for us to be part of. So uh, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Other news since we last met, the downtown Columbus CPAS program was renewed from Columbus City Council with a five-year extension. 
And as part of that program with the Special Improvement District downtown, it's going to take about a $700,000 collective special assessment annually for that program to be successful and to continue functioning. So I think it's important to note that um, and, and see if, you know, we talked about can we do a, a CPAS program in Dublin? So I think that's an exciting conversation to have, but also to understand the context and what would be required for something like that. The all-in-one trip planning and payment app is the third item. That was delayed because of COVID, but it finally had some action since we last met. And that was speaking to who the payment processor will be for the pivot trip planning app that is, uh, is currently in use. Oh, I will talk about money before we take a pause. I'm sure you wanna hear about that. So uh, for right now, we have about $71,000 remaining in the, in the in the CIP balance for mobility initiatives this year. And we have $50,000 that we were just cleared to start reimbursement for. So we hope to have about 121,000 um, moving forward. And as we look to next year's budget, we'll have that carryover as well as the amount that was approved. And we will be pursuing another round of 5310 funds to support the senior disabled shuttle services, as well as any ODOT grant opportunities, particularly for the workforce side. And we will uh, apply for the AARP Community Challenge uh, in 2021. So right here are the next steps, and then we'll pause for a little bit of feedback and input before we move on. The next steps are microtransit. The first one is to continue to look at the city vehicles and to finalize uh, what that could, if we're gonna go down that route to make all those adjustments and all the changes needed in order to use city vehicles. We wanna to continue to engage with our counterparts in the Northwest border planning uh, and, and with respect to the mobility improvements that are gonna be happening. We want to continue advocate for increased code of services. So I'm sure Council or Vice Mayor DeRosa, you'll be doing that as well on the board. But we want to continue to just beat that drum. We need, you know, we, we value CODA and we hope that more code of services are coming to Dublin because that will help our micro transit services. We'll continue to look at funding sources and the level of subsidy provided. Continue to work on our partnerships with employers and senior care facilities. We want to diversify our support in view of the vulnerable funding sources. And that's really speaking to getting buy-in from the business community and maybe some other sponsorship opportunities for this program. Uh, we want to look at adopting progressive parking and demand management policies. That's more of what I think Debbie is working on on this call. And we want to continue to work on the KPIs and to make sure that we're we're meeting the vision that you all have for this program and if there's opportunities to continue to improve it. We want to continue to solicit a regular uh, period or we want to consider, consider a regular solicited period for mobility services, not speaking to the renewals on a regular basis for the operator. And then um, this is from the phase three report to consider adopting a truly on-demand service. So I'm going to take a break here. Uh, that was a lot of information to digest, but if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them and any feedback is welcome. Okay. I guess I'm interested. Yeah. Hey, yeah, okay, thank you. I guess, I guess I'm interested in knowing uh, as per, as against the, um, the funding we're getting from outside sources, can you give me a just a quick analysis rundown on that. We were for this year, we we're given two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the CIP, and we we're able to get um, the fifty thousand dollars for the fifty three ten funds. But that's the senior disabled side. We did win a grant of two hundred fifty thousand dollars from ODOT, but that was taken back, unfortunately, because of COVID. And those were the those are the grants that we won. So it was three hundred thousand dollars. And now it's fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Ryan, I want to say thank you very much for your partnership here. This is this has got to have been an incredibly challenging experience for you. Rewarding, yes, but challenging um, also, and and so sincerely appreciate your partnership with us on this. 
Um, could, could you share a bit about sort of the COVID lessons learned or, or things that we wouldn't have wished this on ourselves, but um, what did we learn here? I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. So I think for me, for lessons learned, um, trust in using services like this is crucial. And we were able to continue running for the workforce during shutdown because of the level of controls we were able to have in, on the vehicle and the driver and the service. And so as you think about, you know, other communities are going the Uber route and saying, hey, we'll subsidize Uber credits. Well, you really lose out on the trust, trustability aspect in, in, a, in a pandemic. Um, I think it also underscored the need to have the flexibility to scale up and down. The city wouldn't want to hold a very large fleet of vehicles for your peak. You would want to hold a fleet of vehicles for the base level of demand. And then as peak comes up, we can help supplement with other professional transportation operators that are available in the area and being able to bring together um, multiple services to lift up for peak. Because if we were holding a lot of the vehicle assets, and so I think it's a better position for the city to be in to have some, but not all. Um, and then the last, I think, is thinking about how delivery is part of the overall need mix of a community and how um, th th there's vulnerable populations before COVID that weren't going into a grocery store. COVID widened how many people were in that vulnerable population. But after COVID, those individuals are go still going to need something. And so I, I, I think we learned a lot here that we're going to be able to use as, as everything recovers. Great. Jane, I had a couple more questions, if that's all right. Yes. <clears throat> yes, please. Sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, the corridor, um, the link corridor project, um, I, I know that's a fairly large project with a fairly large dollar and cents um, attached to that. I, I think um, Dublin's desire to part of that in the in the initial phases is worth a discussion. I'm not sure tonight's the time to have that discussion, but there's a lot of pros and I don't want to say cons, but pros and considerations during this period. And I think it's a I think it's a very important conversation. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I I just know from some background that there's there's a fair bit to to think about there. Um, I, in addition to lessons learned um, that you've learned, Ryan, I know with the, a lot of the um, microtransit that's going on in Central Ohio, there's been a lot of lessons learned together. And I believe Jim, that you're working with with some of our fellow municipalities, I'm getting a nod, I'm hoping here, to set up a meeting, a discussion about what we all learned. Because I guess, you know, one of the questions that it that just uh, highlights to me is, you know, what is, what is quote unquote, the new normal going to look like? You know, many employers have now said you don't have to return for a while, including several large Dublin um, and Columbus based. Um, and those that, that have maybe only two, three days a week, et cetera. And I think just to your point about flexibility, I agree that's going to be absolutely key, but really getting together and saying, you know, how do we think about what have we learned on a regional basis here? And, um, I would very much like to do that. I, I would guess, I would say before we say, okay, and these are you know, 10, 10 things we're going to do um, moving forward, because I just think there's a lot of um, important considerations and time here. I know you guys must have talked about that. JM and Ryan, what are your thoughts on, you know, how, how to do that? And then I'll, I'll relinquish the floor here. Yeah. Um it's, it's a great idea. We reached out to CODA and we're coordinating with them to schedule some time. Uh, we just haven't been able to get that scheduled yet. I know, I, I don't want to speculate, but CODA could just be very busy right now with relaunching some of the service recently. 
but we'll follow up with them again. We would like to reach out to Westerville and Grove City. And if there's any other communities that you can think of, we'll add that to the list as, as well. I have one suggestion in that, and, and it may be to have two separate group meetings with the municipalities. I think you'll have a very different meeting if the providers like Sharon and Coda are not in the room and you can focus on problems from the community's perspective. It's not about the transportation services, it's about what problems do you have. And then a separate meeting where I would love to be at the table with, with CODA and talking about this together. What did we learn? What did they learn? How do we all help each other make each community do this better? We've tried four or five different experiments now. There's benefit for them actually to kind of get blended. And so maybe, maybe there's a couple of meetings in there. Um, but I, I think if you, you pulled folks like Dan from Grove City and you get Westerville to the table and Hilliard, they've all got a unique perspective on it. Would the committee, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just say I appreciate that. I mean, we, we live places, we work places. We're very interconnected here. And as you said, there's been a lot of interesting work and a lot of great lessons learned here. Um, this just, is a real opportunity for us to think about how do we do this, you know, as collectively as possible. So uh, I appreciate that and uh, look forward to those discussions. Would the committee support having those two types of meetings that Ryan just suggested? Would you like to have one just with communities and then one with operators? I think that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, Kathy, what do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I, I I agree the problem solved and the suppliers available are all or however you want to say that the the resources available and the, the needs we're trying to fill however you want to say that um, are important you know I also think it's Ryan you bring a lot of good things to the table in the discussion so you know figuring out how to blend that I think is uh, is an important thing um, and I don't think it necessarily has to occur at a public services committee meeting. I think that we could do it at the convenience of the folks that are attending and bring if if we bring this back to public services can talk about that. But it's mainly research and adding to the the background information we know we're going to need as we go forward. And timing, you know, the timing of when you scale up around this. I know there's still just from my CODA uh, experience, there's, you know, it's there's still a lot of folks who are deciding when they want to re-engage with public transit. Um, and that's not a central Ohio thing. That's a, a world, that's a global thing. Um, and, you know, figuring out how to and coordinating some of that together and to do joint messaging and marketing together joint. I mean, I think that's going to be an important, uh, an important thing. So I think Jane's correct on that. So I appreciate it. Uh, Ryan and JM, I wanted to ask you, um, there's, I think your next steps are, are good, very good. Um, you know, before I get into a couple of specifics, since you've both watched this program grow, if, if you could right now envision it working exactly the way you would like to see it work, what would that look like? In the Dublin connector, what would the Dublin connector be capable of doing? How often would it want, you know, that just what does it look like in its best um, picture? Uh, for me, it's making sure that we are servicing as many senior care facilities as possible. I want to be part of this program and also the ability to have residents age in place and still have a mobility option. Um, I think that's a win and it's a, it's a measure of success, I should say. Um, I would love to see more CODA connections and more CODA service to our community, particularly when we think about the workforce side. But then something to think about is this Dublin connector will be augmented by other party areas are working on. For example, mobility hubs. There's a real opportunity to make sure that the mobility hubs have all of them are serviced by the Dublin connector. So I think that's something that we'll, we'll be looking at um, as we design the program moving forward. Um, other opportunities to transfer between, I mean, the hubs are nice because you can transfer between different um, modes of transportation, but I see the Dublin connector as part of the eco, the mobility ecosystem, if you will, of Dublin. 
and it, it plays a part and it serves demand for mobility in certain respects. Um, but I think jointly the whole ecosystem will really thrive once we can advance the other priority areas in unison. Okay. Ryan? So I think that the last bullet point there about being truly on demand is kind of the future vision of how this all works, right? Where there's the convenience that somebody can just go, I want to ride, I need a ride right now. And we should also be educating them and conditioning and, and gamifying to get people to plan it in advance. Because the more of that transportation we can get to plan in advance, the more efficiently we can deliver it. And to be able to connect with the destinations, we have to digitize those destinations. Now we've got 40, 50 or so, where we have a point of contact. We know the times of when employees arrive. We know the right drop off spot. And if we could get all of the businesses in Dublin to have that same digital profile for their destination, we're gonna be able to help more employees get access to these transportation benefits. I wanna see more <clears throat> companies participating um, now that we're not using that pilot term, I think more companies are going to want to have their employees do it. Um, COVID couldn't have came at a worse time because February was just when we were starting to tell them that the program had, you know, long term support and funding. But there we have the relationships and we have all, all the right connections there to be able to do this. And then the last thing is connecting in the various funding sources. To, to so that this costs the city less. Long term, it's to deliver something that that is funded more through the private sector than 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 through tax dollars. And if we were able to incorporate Medicaid, Medicare, senior options funding, there's medical rides that seniors could be going to, and we could be using that as a funding source. There's um, there could be private pay options. But you start to coordinate these funding sources together, then the burden doesn't fall on taxpayers. It gets spread across all of the existing funders for this type of transportation. But to get there, it requires um, forward thinking organizations and councils like yours to to fund it and fund it from the start of it. OK, um, I want to ask you about the possibility, as you said, wouldn't it be great if all you needed, you need a ride? All you have to do is get it. Do you think the uh, the use of the apps or digital technology will be able to get to a point where everybody in the city will be able to use the connector like that? Because right now I'm extremely jealous because, you know, only the senior communities are using it and the people that are working from, you know, from one place to another. But I think of the use of, you know, going to dinner on Friday night, not want to take your car out. Or, or the kids when you've got four or five kids at home and they all have to get over to the high school for a game and there's not enough parents to take them where they need to go. And even the possibility that it only costs you 50 cents to catch that ride, and that's a funding source, but you have to be able to get it on time when you want it and be, and be able to get it back when you want it. You think as this expands, it's possible that there'll be enough Dublin connector vehicles that they'll be that you hope they'll be available to the community at large. I have from a technology perspective and from a vehicle capacity perspective, we would be able to support a significant increase in demand. It really comes down to budget and being efficient with those budget dollars. And so we've we've started with a few groups. We're proving it out with them and we're asking them to plan it in advance. As the participation in the program grows, we're going to be able to bring that down. I think we're now only asking 12 hours in advance for somebody to schedule. And we could we could bring that down a lot more and we could even be looking at um, private pay options. OK, that's absolutely possible. I think that that sounds great. Um, the employer partnerships, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, I saw that you're going to do some marketing, but it seems to me that for employers who need people, especially this lower wage earner, you know, someone in the minimum wage to low hire, um, I think about a situation I just you know, I ran into this weekend where I know some people who really want decent paying jobs. They're here in Dublin, but they don't have the ability to get here, right, because we don't have this connector. Uh, what kind of response are you hearing? You said the pilots is something you've taken off the table, the word. What are you hearing from them about 
their support, financial support of something like this? What is there any pushback? Is there any like, I'm a little nervous because I don't know kind of answer or are you getting enthusiasm? Now we're getting a lot of enthusiasm. There was some sentiment early on where they didn't want to give it to employees and have it be taken away. And then that employee have a new transportation problem and they lose that employee. So where we found success more recently is connecting with the the business who is using a staffing company for their employment. That's where a lot of the low wage workers are coming through. And so at AC Marriott, one of the top destinations, probably half of those employees are actually coming through a staffing firm. And so we've got that staffing firm now knows that they can offer this as a transportation benefit. So we try to get all of the employers to put this flyer we have in their new hire packet. Okay. And, I, and I think something to consider is formalizing a commuter benefits ordinance in the community. There's six or seven communities in the state of New Jersey, I believe, that have implemented a commuter benefits ordinance, and it can be very easy to um, comply. It's basically saying your business makes it easy for employees to use alternative transportation. They can buy a code of bus pass pre-tax. Every employee learns about the Dublin connector and that would make them qualify. But then it, it starts to become, um, not a bumper sticker, uh, like a, a seal for your community that you're now making mobility a standard for your employers. That's a pretty cool concept. Uh, it would be great if you could forward us some examples of that. So I will. Can, I'll, so I'll send can. that through JM. I've got a little write up on it and I can give you examples of other communities. That yeah, have that's that I, because I think it seems to me as I looked back on your data that you hit about June and July and your workforce ridership just started to soar. And and obviously this stuff takes time to catch on. Personally, I think you should do this. I love the idea that you changed the branding to the Dublin Connector. Because to me, that means it's open to a lot of people. But the share, eh, it kind of, you kind of thought it was only for a small segment of people. And you kind of, it's like a, it's like a bus that just picks up a certain group of school children, right? But the Dublin Connector says, this is something that's going on and it's going to take you places. So I think that's good. So, um, and the flyer is a great idea, but what can we do right now, Jam and, and Ryan, what can we do through our communications department that's going to help increase this awareness. In what way can we suggest to council initiatives that uh, will really increase this awareness? Um, I don't know if the website does it, but I, but I'm just thinking it's it's a this is a marketing issue you have right now is what you have. It is. Yeah, we want to get the word out so that more people will participate in it, especially now that we're allowing seniors who are living at home. That opens us up to a large group of people. Um, instead of just off the top of my head, giving you some marketing ideas, I've got plenty, but why don't I put together something that you guys can look at that is some ideas about communication programs to promote this. Um, JM mentioned on this, we're going to give, it's going to be embedded into your website. It's going to be a map with search filters. And somebody will be able to see, oh, I, I'm going to go schedule a ride to, I want to go to the grocery store. And they'll be able to see where they can go, when the rides are available, and be able to schedule a ride right from your website. Yeah, you know, I, I all I can think about to myself is, um, especially with seniors, they're very nervous about technology, right? It would be great if we had, um, and I know so hard in this pandemic. But um, some real time examples, you know, showing them how you do it. The, the, the connector is sitting right there. This is how easy it is. It's almost like teaching someone how to ride a bus, because as Kathy will tell you, uh, none of my grandkids have ever ridden the bus. You know, to them, that's a foreign vehicle. Other than a school bus, they wouldn't know how to get on a city bus because we just don't we don't use them. So I think we have to be as elementary as teaching people how to make the reservation, how to use the bus, where it goes. I, you know, and I think these vehicles should be out on the street more parked with someone standing there saying, you know about the Dublin connector? Come on in. Let me show you how this works. I mean, that's another. Sometimes we take social media when we really should be just sitting out on the street and talking about it. 
So, but I, I would love to see you bring some ideas forward because it seems to me that what you're reading right now is a huge marketing campaign. And I, I think we... the timing, Jane, is going to be real important, right? Yes, it is. But at least we're thinking we about be, designing you know, it. You don't want to spend your marketing dollars when folks are, you know, you, it, it, again, it's sort of back to lessons learned from the community because I think the time of this is is really going to be essential because too early you're out of money. You're right. I guess what I'm saying is maybe not jump and go do it, but but trying to imagine what it looks, what that campaign looks like to be really successful. And I'll, I will say before we started, before COVID hit, we were planning to do our first mobility workshops with some of the senior care facilities, which would incorporate travel training as part of that uh, demonstration. But we're gonna have to retool that a little bit now with the COVID times to think about how we can effectively communicate that. How are you capturing the seniors that aren't in the facilities though? Because those are the ones that are really isolated. That's a great question. Well, if, if you were over 55 and on Facebook in the city of Dublin this week, you probably got an ad that said the Dublin connector was running. We ran some, some ads. Um, we're working on getting some press and media. That's the best way for, for a senior who's living at home to learn about it. But then the community center, uh, that's an area where we can use that for promotion. And there are organizations like Sintero that serve seniors living at home and they have caseworkers who are helping us to make introductions. Yes, and even Meals on Wheels isn't a bad idea. I don't know if they, if we can pay to have a flyer sent in with a Meals on Wheels or even the churches who have volunteers who deliver Meals on Wheels is a good uh, place to maybe ask them to just drop it by so they'll know about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. John, any other any thoughts? No, uh, no, I think you guys are covering it. I think um, I, I, I like the idea of getting down to the weeds and talking to the other guys and micro guys. I think that's very interesting. Um, nope. Uh, I, th I know you got a pretty a bunch of stuff to cover tonight. So I know we've got to get going through the rest of it. I do want to say one thing as a follow up, Jane, when you asked about the success moving forward, what would that look like? For the workforce side, I failed to mention that a 1% mode shift is what we're seeking. So if we have about 70,000 workers, if we can get 700 regular riders, then that's a success for us. Okay, great. Well, I'll let you go on because I, I guess I didn't realize you had more, so go. <laughs> it's a good update. We'll we'll continue on. Okay. Good. So next we're gonna we're gonna talk about shared micromobility or the subject of bike share. We have been working with Trip Bikes, which was formerly Rome and Rome Bikes, and they feature a dockless e-bike product. So think of those bikes that have the fat tires that are usually have a color on them, and they have uh, pedal assists which is easier for people to use, particularly if they're aging in place or if they have some sort of injury or what have you, or just want an, a sweat-free ride, which is my preferred way of riding, but it covers all the bases. So it needs to say, um, it's a very exciting to see this launch in our community. And we'd like to, we're shooting for a launch in spring of next year. So we'll continue to update you on that. With the Kogo Bike Share, if you recall from our public meeting that kicked all this off in 2017, a bike share was one of, if not the largest or the most um, requested mobility option uh, that wanted the community wanted added to their community. Um, we heard them, we've been working with uh, the Kogo bike share for since then over the years. And where we've landed and is partnering with other communities on a joint application for Morpsey attributable funds as those opportunities arise. When, um, Columbus, Upper Arlington, Bexley, and Grandview Heights, they did this a few years ago successfully. We were able to get a bulk uh, grant that covered about 80% of the bike stations. We want to mimic exactly what they did. And we're working with Upper Arlington, Hilliard, City of Columbus, and Metro Parks currently on another round of that kind of application. We understand it's gonna be at least two to three years, if not longer but we are doing the first part of that application requirement, which is a public input phase. 
we're partnering with a studio workshop at Ohio State. We do this in spring as part of one of their studios. So they'll be able to do the public engagement, the public workshops, and uh, indicate where the preference is for stations to be placed in the Northwest quadrant of Franklin County. So that's the scope and the aim that we're going with the bike share that is docked to the Cogo bike share. Okay, so the two you showed us, uh, um, the trip or the uh, docked and undocked ones, what, which, which direction are we going to go into? Which one are you picking? Uh, or which one those. do you think we should go into? Because I'm really interested in this. And I, I are we going to follow this with scooters too, or no? I don't know if our market is primed for scooters, but that was at least the feedback we got from Lime Are we looking at their uh, pilot. So, I don't know if we're looking for a, a scooter share, but we do have, we do want to work on different code revisions that are maybe needed in order to have other okay. share, like other micro mobility options right. in our community. Well, but in terms of your question about which bike share, we're going to go for both. And the reason we're going for both is the trip bike is little to no cost to the, the community because it doesn't require dock stations or infrastructure. Um, and those are really geared towards hotels and visitors. And we want to think of a method that people at hotels could, we can give a certain batch of them to a hotel and they can use it for their visitors to use and rent out or what have you. So the target is more the visitors with that bike share. Um, it's of course can be used by residents um, with the COGO dock stations, those are a great uh, component of mobility hubs, particularly the infrastructure part of it. So we figured they could be for whether they can be for um, residents, they also can be for visitors if they're on the regional bike share network and want to funnel up to Dublin from other parts of the region. Um, so we see this as a regional mechanism, which will give us strength in our application for funds to, to go for those. So I guess the Kogo dock station is expanding the region or expanding the system that's already in place and uh, having more accessibility to Dublin. And then the trip bikes is more for visitors and um, maybe unique trips by residents. JM, what's what's different? We tried this, it didn't go well. So what's different now? When what was the first part of that? It broke up. I'm sorry. I mean, we tried this once and it didn't it didn't end in a positive way, right? We tried it and they left. So what is interesting to these providers now? Is it because they're electric or is it, I mean, what's what's the difference between then and now? Are you talking with respect to the line, the line pipe share that we had? Okay, the, the line was, it was a great, I mean, there were successes from line in the sense that we had the data that was brought from that, but it, what we found with Lime is that they were, they had a very specific business model and they were also transitioning to more scooters from the bikes. And we learned that the bikes were good for the Dublin market, but the scooters were not a good market uh, according to their data and their marketing. So it was in a weird transitional play, uh, phase and we, as I understand it, they phased out the bikes and were going all scooters in Columbus. And so we're kind of on the tail end of that. I think another thing is that they're a startup with investors, and I, I think they have um, they have to fulfill certain obligations of having that model of business. Whereas Kogo and Trip are local to Columbus, and they have a more of a focus on the impact of the community and providing accessibility to the community. I think a good example is that of that is Kogo now has um, a pass that is for people who are lower income. And so they can still have accessibility into the program, but it's more of a social equity uh, spin to it. But I think with a local system, we have more control and more expectations of that system. Um, whereas the line was, you know, they're in quickly and then out is just as quick. Yeah, um, I, I would underscore that. I think, you know, one of the big differences between even an organization like Share and an organization like Lime, um, Lime is purely about profit and purely about like big scale nationwide global profit. 
And so they really weren't interested in getting down into the weeds and looking at, um, to Ryan's point, like how, how, do, how could something like a commuter benefits ordinance uh, help, help with the funding of this? How could grants help with the funding of this? Um, you know, as, as the connector, you know, one of the things that, uh, that kind of underlined uh, interest in a connector was a lot of Dublin employers were feeling pressure about parking, not having enough parking for their employees. Um, but now it may be, well, we have a lot of transit dependent folks looking to get to work, but now the transit service is like cut. Well, that creates maybe a different funding opportunity. A company like Lime, that's just, that's never going to reach their attention level. Um, and so these groups like Kogo and Trip are, are, are more comparable to share. They're, they're local, they're, they're regional. They understand Ohio. They understand like how do you cobble together um, different funding sources, including grants, to make something sustainable for the community. Yeah, and uh, I think. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I will say with the next slide, it may also indicate our direction. From last time, we had a question about you know what has. How has bike share performed during the pandemic? And so we looked in some of the numbers at Kogo, and we saw that over the past the past two years prior to 2020, they were averaging about 4,000 rides a month between March and June. So in the same time in 2020, they saw a 29% boost in ridership. I think that was mostly due to the pandemic and its cut to transit services. So in the very beginning, the shelter in place, a lot of transit was discontinued before it was slowly brought back. And people, some people saw the Kogo as an opportunity to get around town um, without the transit service and uh, some other maybe mobility of restrictions. So I'll give you the next steps and we'll take a pause for feedback. We want to work on the launch of TRIP in 2021. We're going to complete the public input phase for the COGO expansion grant that we're pursuing also in spring 2021. And we want to make sure that we're contemplating code revisions as the city considers more micromobility options, speaking to Councilmember Reiner's point or his question earlier. So I want to pause here. We would like to field any questions as it relates to micromobility and bike share. Do you see most of the use of these as visitors or residents? Or what is the breakdown between those two? The as we understand the trip is the trip bike share is much more geared towards visitors, particularly those in hotels and maybe um, kind of those uh, like like extended stays or something of that sort. With Coco, it's really open to everybody. It could be people who work here and want a quick lunch time, uh, lunchtime ride, or want to uh, go. F you know, it could be a resident who wants to have a leisurely ride. The thing with Coco is that they seem to be much more time incremented. So I don't know if you have half an hour or an hour to get between different stations to drop off your bike. So it, it limits you in the sense of short trips. With the trip bike share, it seems like it's more of a recreational, leisurely kind of ride that's a little bit longer in duration. Yeah, you know, one of my observations, and um, I've ridden my bike a lot um, during this time phrase. You just try to buy a bike right now. Lots of luck to you, right? Just try it. Or, or like me, get your bicycle serviced. Try that. I called yesterday. It's a four-month waiting period to get my bike serviced right now. So I, you know, I think there's interesting demand. I, I just wonder when I think about what residents would like, um, is it a bike for an hour or a bike for the weekend or what? I mean, I think, again, I think there's some interesting COVID lessons learned here when we think about business models or whatever that might make this stuff successful. Because I'm not sure, as a resident, I would want it for 30 minutes, but I, I might want it for the afternoon, you know, some models or whatever. So again, I just think there's an opportunity in this. Um, 
Well, I, I, I ran into a, that didn't literally run into just, just, you know, just passed and stopped to talk to a woman who was in her eighties that said, I just got my bike out again and I'm riding it. And she's now like going like gangbusters. So, you know, there's just some interesting things we're learning here. I'm not sure the traditional models actually fit that. So something to think about. Right. Hey guys, on your next steps, uh, I, I'd say go for it. Uh, about this, I, I had a uh, uh, bird app on the phone. I enjoyed both of them. They were just sort of a fun adventure. I uh, gave you something to do, you know, risk your life <laughs> on a scooter. Uh, but it was fun. So, but you no, know, these next two things, let's do it. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's get some downtown transportation for people going to lunch. Uh, from their office buildings and for guests that come staying at our hotels to sort of tool around and see the town. Uh, the more of this, the better. I'm all for it. I, you know, this kind of micro uh, mobility, I think, is great. And it's great. And uh, I was in Milwaukee and I got out my app for, um, oh, my God, I think it was Bird and jumped on one of those and ran around all the historical stuff and ran up to the Paps Mansion. And, you know, just a fun thing to do. And uh, right now people are just dying to do something because there's nothing else left to do including sports venues and every other thing bike or get out on a uh, scooter is just just something to kill some time and have some fun so let's go for it let's get through these next steps and see what happens L looking forward to seeing what you guys come back with you know from these guys so I wanted to ask you too it seems to me that I agree with all of that I, I think it's going to be exciting to see new mobility options available but um, I live on Dublin Road and south of the historic district. So I see people on bikes constantly, more bikes than I've ever seen people riding. But what I wonder is um, about the use of the mobility hubs and when you plan on that, because it seems to me that to really make an awareness level rise around here, people have to see that these aren't just a temporary thing, that they're actually, we have a permanent mobility hub, you will find them here. This is where you go to get one. I mean, that we're serious about this. So what's the plan? Or maybe it's coming up here about the mobility hub. Is that coming on your slides, JM? A little it's farther it, down the line it's coming up, but you're, oh, on the right okay. you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Are there any co other comments before we move on? Okay. Well, thank you for the feedback, and we'll continue on. Sure. Mobility hubs. What perfect timing. <laughs> so I that we're gonna talk about mobility hubs and I'm gonna give it to Tom to take away because he is an expert in this field and he can answer all the questions. Yeah, great. So um this is a this is something that actually came out of the phase one visioning session. So you know the circulator shuttle options was kind of topmost of everyone's mind. And then suddenly, you know, shared mobility, like the, the hubless bikes, the line bikes were hot for a while and then it became the scooter. So that was kind of like an opportunity to catch, catch an opportunity that was, you know, just presented to the city at the time. Um, but in the background has been this concept of mobility hubs, which is really about as Dublin continues to add these multimodal options for getting around Dublin or getting to connection points like CODA services to, to get to the region. You know, how do we create an intuitive, you know, uh, JM called it an ecosystem. How do we make that more intuitive for all ages? So it's not, everything is not just on an app. Um, and Jane, to your point, like there's these connection points that kind of send this branded message of this this is part of our infrastructure now and it's it's branded it's not a pilot it's not going to you know look you know it's not going to disappear or um, be you know we're going to invest in you know, something completely different next month this is this is part of our investment in the future so circling back to the concepts that we generated in phase one um we came up with four levels of mobility hub so if you can imagine you know the the points of dublin that will have the most or the widest range of these mobility options they're going to have the biggest most complex hubs and so those are areas where you expect a lot of visitors 
and you may have your higher density residential communities. Um, and so that is where you're going to have a, a hub with like everything, uh, likely a connection point to transit, um, but any kind of, you know, bike share, scooter share that you have, um, information, uh, not just for residents, but for visitors. So if I, you know, go to Jenny's ice cream, maybe uh, I'm near a mobility hub that lets me know just all the, uh, the wide range of opportunities for me to connect from there to somewhere else without getting back in my car and driving there. Um, the next level is a park and ride hub. And that's, and that's really piggybacking on transit riders who are, you know, connecting in Dublin to somewhere else or connecting to Dublin from somewhere else. And they're looking for that classic first mile, last mile connection point. And so that, that's a, that's a market in waiting. And, uh, you know, there you're just providing, you know, the, the connection services that make sense to them and making it easier to make that transfer. And that could even include, um, in many cities, they'll provide sheltered bike lockers. Um, so maybe I live within an easy bike ride of the park and ride and I would ride my bike, uh, but I'm not going to tie it up to a tree and let it get rained on all day long. So uh, a bike locker could be you know, a component of a mobility hub there. And then next, branching out into other points of, uh, points of connection where, where you find higher densities of uh, more residents than visitors, but campus and community center hubs. And this is where it's already points of congregation for the community where they're seeking access to recreation or some kind of services. And while they're there, you have these mobility hubs. And one of the unique opportunities of that type of hub is uh, that is a point where you can provide um, training and information. So for, again, can, you know, getting to the aging in place opportunity, talking to seniors about, you know, you haven't ridden a bike in 30 years. Well, here's a bike that you can try for a half an hour. Um, or how do I use this app to connect to this connector that I've been hearing about? So s potential for staffed resources at some place like a recreation center or a library um, to pr provide that kind of information that complements the hub and, and um, makes it more user friendly for all ages. And then finally, neighborhood center hubs. And these can be you know, very low, low scale, uh, very simple. You, know, you can combine uh, bike racks with a bike repair station near a point of connection to a regional bike trail or just a park or some other area uh, within neighborhoods, within the community that um, people pass by. It's not necessarily, you know, lots of foot traffic all the time, but if it's branded, if it's visible, uh, the community starts to recognize, oh, this is a resources. This is a resource that's close to my home um, that will make it easier for me to get around the community um, without my car. Next slide. Um, so this is, this is an example. Uh, again, I think this is from phase one where we drew up a concept of what a downtown mobility hub might look like. So again, this is going to have everything, including uh, transit shelter, uh, bike parking, a kiosk uh, with you know, a digital interactive information station uh, so people can dynamically look through information opportunities um, about what's, what's available in Dublin. Potentially a bike house. So if I live in an apartment in Bridge Park and the, the bike parking uh, opportunities in my apartment are not so great, uh, many cities have provided, a, you know, within maybe a, one of the garages, you can build out a bike house. And that's a lit, secure, uh, indoor, um, you know, room that you have a key to that maybe you pay a fee for, um, and it has repair resources and, and things like that. And that makes it easier if I'm a bike enthusiast to, uh, choose housing in, in uh, bridge park, even if, uh, th that particular apartment building doesn't offer the kind of bike, bike house that I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's changed really since the, the first phase of this car sharing is in kind of in this interim stage, uh, you know, car to go is no longer, uh, I'm not sure it's in any cities anymore, but I know it's, it's not in Columbus. Um, but we have actually have been talking with car share companies and they're, they're moving toward 
many of them are moving toward a model where they're a car share company that's just for an apartment community, uh, sort of a closed population. So again, a different funding source. They're not, they're not, I think the writing was on the wall that these are not going to become very profitable businesses. So the folks that are operating car share now are looking at different ways to fund these things, including access to jobs. So it hasn't gone away. It's part of the fluid system right now. Um, but th this would be an example of uh, how car share would have been um, accommodated at this type of mobility hub. Uh, ne next page, next slide. And then uh, this is a, these are some visual examples of some of those lower key mobility hubs that I talked about. So again, some you know a lot of these are very simple. They piggyback on a, a transit stop, uh, like the top left in Minneapolis and and, and the bottom left or and I, I really like this the top right which is in columbus uh putting you know shared scooters shared bikes bike parking a bit of information wayfinding next to a library this is already a part of your community infrastructure where people know uh, this is where i go for information and for resources that are shared for the community and i think a mobility hub really dovetails nicely with that and makes it easier to um already you know, take advantage of those community patterns where people do gather for this type of thing. Um, and the, the bottom right, Montreal, this could be, a, an, again, a, a neighborhood or a community-based hub. Uh, some bike parking, a bike repair station, makes it easier to own and maintain that bike. So for example, Kathy, uh, you don't, maybe if your repair is simple enough uh, and you, you're looking at a four month wait list, there, there's something out there in your neighborhood that you can take advantage of to keep your bike rolling. I think that's the last of those slides. Jim, you are on mute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Almost almost perfect, but thank you. <laughs> has to happen once on every call, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom, for that great recap of mobility hubs. We're gonna the next steps for mobility hubs, we're gonna take the tier one mobility hubs in that chart, the first two. Uh, rows, and we're going to look at site-specific designs for each one. So the mobility hub, let's say at the Dublin parking garage, um, the Dublin library parking garage, there's bike parking there. It's a really nice start to what can be a dynamic mobility hub. So we want to look at, we want to take a you know closer look and see what are the opportunities there. We want to continue to engage with CODA and other partners to see what are opportunities as they come along. And um, how can we continue to provide multimodal you know, options and easily transfer between the two or more? So let's take a pause here. What are some feedback or comments that you have with regard to mobility hubs? Um, you know, I don't know if we're ready. Ready? I think you know it's a great idea. Bridge Street and a number of other areas. But um, if we're doing that, uh, and this goes back to Jane, and, and zoning, if you're thinking about this, Jane, we're gonna we're gonna square footage to set this thing in motion for the bicycles, for the stop, and all the stuff we haven't really carved out in the past in uh, our city. So in the future, we, you know, we're gonna have to start focus on that, or we're gonna have to appropriate the lands to do these because of the. Uh, the uh, area they take up, but uh, no, I mean, that was good information. That's what I got. I don't know. But, uh, maybe you guys are going to solve that for us because as you run through all your statistics, embarrassing how people around our community, you know, better understanding that and then tell us, hey, you know, this is this is where we should be uh, planting. And yeah. there's, a, there's a slide coming up that has a better idea of where options could be. Yeah. All right. I would say, I would say you don't start with the big, you don't have to start with the big ones. And I think that's where, um, you know, phase one, that's, that was the design challenge was you know, what, what could these look like? But you can start small and there, there are, you know, so for example, the park and ride, um, when the sea pass, which Jam talked about earlier, really started to take off in Columbus. It was interesting. Your parking ride lot started running out of parking. 
um, you know, their Coda's drivers were suddenly, you know, having the the people that they were picking up say, well, "Where am I supposed to park? The lot was full today." And so there you have an opportunity where, you know, providing some bike parking or something that enables more uh, connections to that lot other than driving um, is, is something that could be useful already. And I guess the, the opportunity here is when you do that, brand it as a mobility home. Use, use the, you know, the, uh, the style of infrastructure, a color pattern, um, you know, whatever your branding that you want to use for the mobility hub so that people start to recognize when they see these points of connection, um, this isn't just happening as a one-off or as a, you know, rushed response to a situation, but as part of a plan so that as they get bigger, um, people start to recognize, oh, this is what's going on here. You know, uh, Tom, I was just thinking as you were talking about this, as I think about how we've dropped bikes into the city and we we tried this there in the lime and that sort of thing. Um, people are confused about what it is. It takes a little while to learn, you know, exactly what this new little initiative we're doing is. I like the idea of the mobility hub being a design concept that is completed in your mind about what the, the tiers are great. That's very understandable. And I think wayfinding is really essential because even if you do the park and ride, which I think is a good idea, it's like the hybrid, you've got the space, you know people are already going to this so-called transportation hub, and you can infill it with other alternative ways of getting to and from it. But when with step one, draft site-specific designs for tier one, I think the design should be drafted for all of them and the wayfinding should be consistent with somewhat uh, all of them so that you can be at any hub and understand that there is another hub that might even have more options for you. Now, I wouldn't expect that you have a big sign at tier four, right? But you may have something small there, a flyer in a or a little something you can do with your app. You could use your app and it would pop up and tell you where all the hubs are. Do you know what I'm saying? So that everybody knows that this is part of Dublin's infrastructure, just because you find one small area. So I think the design piece is really important. And when it comes to the the, the one at the library, I like the idea that you're cradling these bikes up against the wall of a place. Like there's this, there's this um, supposedly a pocket park between the library and the garage. We worried to planning and zoning that that would be a very unusable space because it's so narrow and it's dark. No sunshine gets to it. I walked it the other day and I said to myself, it's exactly what I thought it would be. It just doesn't have any activation. Perfect place to have bikes because then people will go there. They'll talk. They'll get their bike. They'll drop it off. Now the pocket park has a function, has a reason to be there. So I like I like the idea of the library and it also a great place for wayfinding. So I think the design piece is really important as you try to design, you know, the wayfinding signs and um, and trying to help people get to these places. So I like the whole thing. It's good. Great. And I failed to mention, uh, I, I fully endorse that idea that the, con the if the connector can reliably stop that at least the tier one, two, and three mobility hubs, that really starts to reinforce what these things are all about. I would, uh, and my, the only thing I would add, I, I think figuring out a way forward is wonderful here. The only thing I would add is let's use some technology in this. Right. I, I need to know there's a bike there if I'm going to go. I need to know what time the bus is going to be there. I need to know what time the connector is going to be there. Um, other, you know, if we're going to do this, let's let's integrate that as well. Maybe that's already part of this. That's one of the biggest frustrations you show up. It's not there. So how do we solve that problem? That would be my only um, additional comment. Thanks. Okay. Thank I you. I absolutely agree with that. That's perfect. I think we have to have that. It's too hard to find things and, and bike over to something or ride over to something and you find out there's no transportation available for you when you get there. Great, thank you for the feedback. 
The last call before we move on. Okay. Oh. The next mobility priority, priority area that we're going to touch on is wayfinding. And this uh, Council Member Fox goes to what you just mentioned. There, uh, wayfinding, a great way to think about it is how do you orient yourself in the community and how do you understand where your destination is? And so wayfinding helps with all of that. They use maps, directional information symbols, other other intuitive things to help guide the path users to their destinations and to let you know when you can get on another trail or you can leave whatever you're on right now. I think the important I think another thing, important thing to highlight with wayfinding is it's uh, if it's um, it can highlight local and regional points of interest and also point to where are some areas you can explore in the community that if you're not if you're visiting Dublin, for example. We have been engaging a lot with Central Ohio Greenways on this effort of wayfinding, particularly when it comes to regional trails. I wanted to give you a snapshot of the trails in proximity to our community. The, the Montangi Trail is highlighted in red on the right side of the screen. We have the Sayota Trail in blue in the middle, and the dots are indicating that a trail is planned but not yet built or implemented there. And then finally, we have this green trail that goes through the middle of Dublin, and the Central Ohio Greenways Board back in February approved um, approved a measure to make this trail a uh, regional trail of significance. So we're working with them on what does that mean for short-term and long-term investment in this trail, but also what are the opportunities to connect our shared use path system to this regional trail significance. As we had that conversation, the Central Greenways gave us a lot of feedback that our regional trail system is very linear, and it'd be interesting to do a kind of bike loop where you can branch off from a trail and explore different parts of a community that's off the trail. So with that in mind, we began to think of what are some bike loops that we can do for Dublin? And we wanna make them themed, which going back to the wayfinding discussion is, so you can have some interest and get people out and about. As we take a closer look, I did put schools as red dots to give you a context of how this can interact with the park system and the school system. We started our first loop looking at a recreation themed loop. And this starts and ends more or less at the Dublin Community Recreation Center. And it's an eight mile loop that will take about 40 minutes at a leisurely pace going around it. What's important to note about this loop is that it does connect and overlap with the regional trail significance, as well as connect the Dublin Dream High School and to a lesser, more or less extent, Kaufman High School. It's a pretty easy ride to get to the rec center from Kaufman. And there's a middle school um, as well in there. There's several parks that it connects to, including the Metro Park, the Glacier Ridge Metro Park. So we see this as a good first uh, recreation-focused loop to look at wayfinding that is unique that would interact with or with the regional trail. <clears throat> Excuse me. From there, we also have proposed mobility hubs. Some of this is taken from that chart that we just showed you of the tiers. Some of this is uh, suggested sites from Nelson Nygaard's analysis of our community. And then uh, what we're trying to do is think of other opportunities for mobility hubs, which may be, uh, which may happen when we do that public input phase with the COGO grant and see where in stations to be located. But I think using the tier system we have, it makes sense that we'll have a cluster and bridge park, and those would be the neighborhood center hubs. We have the park and ride in the mix there which uh, could have some sort of influence with other uh, other establishments like the new Mar North Market that's expanding there. Across the river is the Dublin Branch parking garage, which we, we mentioned with the library system. There's a cluster at Franz and Metro Place North, and that's to capture the hotel cluster there, but also the office cluster that is located in that proximity. City Hall and the Rec Center in the um, Dublin High School, as, as well as the Emerald Campus. We have Dublin Methodist Hospital located, Ohio University Ranch Campus in the Glacier Ridge Metro Park. 
this is a good start. There may be others that come to light, but I at least want to give you an idea that this is all starting to tie together in the wayfinding, as Councilmember Fox mentioned, will help with the mobility hubs and vice versa. So I wanted to give you an idea that we're looking at this. We want to look at other bike loops that are themed. Those can be entertainment focused those around Bridge Park and Historic District. There, there could be community you know, fitness challenge loops where we think of ways to get more people out and about and engaged in active transportation and fitness. There's other opportunities for historic and cultural trails and bike loops, which I think could be great with our assessment that we have. So the, I guess the, the point is the, there's limitless opportunities and we can continue to build out these bike loops as it relates to the, the trail system. Is the uh, Scioto Trail has been discussed for years, and I guess that was a big initiative that would have to really come to office since they control most of it. Is there anything, any life in that, or is that still just dead? I think it has a long way to go, but I can't speak to the specifics. I got this map from the Central Hall Greenways website, and they update it periodically. So they have it indicated as a trail, but I don't know what the where that lies today. So we there's can really, with there's, you. There's no, from what I can ascertain, and uh, I think it'd be great because the Olin Tangi bike trail is awesome. But this thing's been kicked around for a long time, but I just don't see much coming from Columbus. On the regional trail that you were talking about, is there a funding source for that? Or is that just a designated uh, trail for ex sort of existing area? I believe they take the information from communities and provide it into their map. So we would report out as Dublin what trails we have currently and what we have planned for the next year. And then we would follow up with them and they would update their website. So I think this is self-reporting from the communities to MORPC, which then puts it into this mapping tool. Gotcha. All right. Does the Visitor Bureau have a designated um, loops, you know, in trying to find activities that are out of doors, right? Um, because I was in, um, where was I? Uh, Indianapolis a couple weekends ago. And, you know, they make a big deal of their walking loops, right? And the maps for that. And it's, I mean, we have what they have, right? In terms of, of walking paths, whatever, but just um, promoting them that way. Are they doing that? And I just don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to follow up with you on that, uh, Vice Mayor DeRosa. Because if you think about, to your point here, where you start, um, you know, from their support of, of the loops, um, that yeah, the red loop, I ride that, that quite a bit the and it's a beautiful beautiful um loop it's not hard to do um and there's but to your point there's so many of them so I don't, you know there's nothing to really stop you but to really elevate it and say this is an eight mile or here's a easy three mile or a hard 15 mile loop or something i think i think that's a great idea that's a good suggestion thank you we'll follow up with them also um i don't get out and ride my bike like kathy does but um the the times that i have written it which i can't say has been in the last couple of years but um i found that i wasn't sure where the bike paths went and where i was going to end up and how far i was going to have to go to get home so wayfinding is i agree wayfinding is really important because you can get started and then not know how to get back i don't know what the trails show right now do we have directional signs or anything or or red loop blue loop signs on our bike paths now i hate to say that i don't know but i don't know <laughs> with respect to this wayfinding we we had a pilot last year where we did the um, around the cinco de mayo holiday <clears throat> season we had i think cinco de mayo so it was a fun little play on it and we did a bike ride and we had some stickers that were put down these are vinyl adhesives uh, we did that one to test out, you know, would they be good wayfinding tools for the on pavement at grade? 
but also are they durable? How will they fare with the weathering and other things? And to our surprise, they a lot of them held up. Uh, and so that was a good test for us to move forward with the vinyl sticker adhesives as a first uh, kind of comb through of the loop. And then any adjustments we need to make, they're pretty easy to do because we can take those back up and do that. And then for long term, I'm going to get into it on the next slide. But I think we have a different uh, idea for possibilities for long term solutions. OK, yeah, I think I like the fact that you've got the possibility to open up the community to people outside to come in to do a historical loop or a recreation loop or a fitness loop. I think that's great. But if we do that, then we have to end the wayfinding or somehow educate them to what they actually see in our community. You know, leather lips or, or the bike path and um, that, that leads through Metro Park or, or anything that's of interest along the way. I think that that brings families and people into the city to kind of explore a little bit better. Let's Absolutely. And something we learned just real quick along the way with Central Greenways is coordination with surrounding municipalities and communities. So if we're going to highlight regional or local points of interest, we want to make sure it's consistent as that trail meanders between different municipalities. Um, so I think that speaks to your point of being just overall orientation and wayfinding. Great. The Metro okay. Parks do a good job of that, I think. Yeah, so there's some models there. So have we... Um... Have we sort of given up on moving up from, uh, I, I, I take it we have, um, the one person who uh, was supposedly leading this initiative has left the city, but the initiative of moving us up from um, bronze to a civil, civil a silver level in the national bike rate, rating, uh, is that pretty much over just because the expense of um, painting out the streets and all the rest of the stuff we're going to do and all the initiatives we've got to start in uh, bike related uh endeavors are we pretty much done with that i haven't heard much from the government the last couple of years on doing anything with that and i guess another sidebar question which probably isn't really in your bailiwick is um since we got 100 miles of bicycle trails and they're all excellent uh I, i'm just sort of disappointed about how many kids really don't ride their bicycles to school and this probably isn't your issue but it's just sort of sad. I mean, to see the parking lot filled with really nice, fancy, overpriced cars and very few kids really riding their bikes. I don't know if we could ever fix that. I know that's also part of the national requirement for getting a better rating uh, is how many, you know, what percentage of the people here actually ride their bike to work and stuff, which uh, is hard to do in, in a community like ours. I have to yeah, thank you I, for the question. I'll have to double check with the city mayor's office on the status of that initiative for the bronze or gold level. I think it's um the bicycle friendly community designation. Um, with respect to getting more students involved, I think there's programs we can engage with Morpsy. I know, um, I don't know if there's any programs in particular, but we can certainly check with them and see what's on what's possible for Dublin to look at. Hey, Jonna, I can tell you there's a lot of elementary and middle school kids that ride their bikes because I see them out and about. The high school, no, but you'll see a lot at the elementary and middle school. Yeah, it'd be great just to do everything we could to encourage them. Some, you know, and I spent a lot of time on the bicycle task force and went to Portland and studied all this and came home and we set up the comprehensive bicycle trail program, which we pretty much completed south, east and west. Took about three years and a lot of money. But, yeah, I, there's programs you do, um, you know, to incentivize them or sort of you know, make it a cool thing again to ride your bike, which is pretty tricky for that group you're not talking about or that you're talking about that really doesn't do it. And I think it's neat that the, you know, some of the younger kids are out doing it. This COVID thing may have um, sparked a little more of this too, because people being so bored that they're stuck at home, they're trying to look for something to do. And so many of them have now discovered all these trails we've zoned in since 1980, either to walk on, run on, or, or be on a bicycle. So, you know, thank you, God, because, you know, we were the progressive leaders of all this kind of stuff. And our people now have the benefit during this crisis to get out and enjoy, you know, what we created. Before, I used to think they were totally underutilized. 
But now I see on Sunday and stuff, people all out riding and running and it really lifts you up, you know, because also it's tied to just good overall health. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what can be done to expand this. I think we're, I think not from discussions with management going to elevate us from bronze. To, and I don't think there's any silver cities in Ohio, maybe wrong, but just the expense and the involvement of getting our people involved in using bicycles um, and the road costs and painting them out and all the rest of it. Sort of, we sort of dampered that down and that's fallen behind as an initiative, just like, um, you know, a blue city initiative for good health. And some of these things have just fallen by the wayside, you know, changes of people in the administration and changes of council people just, you know, let some let go. So anything we can do to get people out to enjoy these trails is really important. Thanks. Uh, JM and, and Tom, a couple of things I just want to throw in before we move on to the next one. Um, one of the things I think is important and we need to move forward and maybe talk to uh, council about is that in the wintertime, uh, a lot of our bike paths aren't clear to snow. And um, I think if we're serious about this, about really encouraging mobility uh, options and utilizing the paths the way we want to, we're going to have to be committed to clearing them in the bad weather. Um, if they're city owned paths, I know that's expensive, but I think this is part of the cost of providing, you know, usable infrastructure. Um, so one, that's one thing I think we have to address. And secondly, uh, as John said, maybe in coordination with Parks and Rec, when you do get the spring uh, lift for the first mobility hub or getting the bike uh, e-bikes out there, maybe this is a good time to create some sort of a bike challenge. You know, there's, we have this walking challenge for people. Why not a bike challenge? Why not encouraging people to get out, ride their bikes, report it back, award prizes? Why don't we make excitement around biking be a spring initiative? So just a thought. You know, that's a good thought, Jane. And, you know, we can steal a lot of programs from uh, cities that have done this, like Portland, that are only, uh, you know, gold level cities and silver level cities. They've, already have a lot of these things that they've worked their way through, it's sort of like stealing ordinances from other municipalities and sliding the name Dublin and dumping off the name whatever, Worthington or Columbus. So there are some things, you know, that we could request from other communities related to this whole bicycle mobili mobility issue that I think has already been pretty well uh, saturated with thought and a lot of discussion and drug on for years. and. Uh, you know, you look at places like Portland where they put a lot of emphasis on bicycles. There's some of these communities are very, very progressive. Not that we're not. I think we've done a great job. I think. But to your effort, Jane, you know, try to see what they're doing and how they do it. And we have read some of these in the past and it's sort of fallen by these, these uh, stimulating initiatives for our young people. So, no, I think those are all good things. It's something we should really look to. And I wouldn't limit Thank it you. either. Yeah, thanks, John. I wouldn't limit it either just to bikes either. Maybe it's about wheels. Because as I've seen people come by my house, I've seen tricycles, I've seen strollers, I've seen wagons, I've seen all kinds of things. And I think maybe we can be a little bit more unique instead of just, I mean, obviously we're encouraging biking, but maybe the challenge is how do you get your wheels on the path? You know, I don't know. But I think it should be in conjunction with your efforts, Parks and Rec, and then communications, let's put all of our staff departments together and see if we can't elevate that uh, use of the path. So I'll let you go on so we're not running over time too much here. Okay, no, this is all good. Thank you. And, uh, two, a couple quick thoughts. And I, I think events, and Ryan before mentioned gamification, I think that's a great way to get those high schoolers. I've heard the same thing. The younger kids, like they love the bikes because that's how they have independence. As soon as they get the driver's license, they're filling up that parking lot. Um, gamification is a great way to get uh, that demographic interested in, in you know, biking at least a few times a year. Um, and, and John, you're right. There are no, there are about 20 bronze cities in Ohio, no silver cities, yes, no gold. Thanks, Tom. Uh, real quick before we wrap up wayfinding. These on the left is the vinyl sticker I was mentioning, and those can be for the short term as we get the 
um, get the loop right and any adjustments you need to make. Uh, we are exploring the possibility of a stencil and, the, and glow in the dark paint as a long term solution. And that is speaking to a lot of the past are not lit, but we could possibly extend their uh, their use past dusk if we had some, you know, or maybe have an interesting bike ride or some sort of programming. Um, but needs to say, this can be an interesting area to look into. So we're working with engineering and uh, see if we can pilot a media segment on one of the shared use paths moving forward. So if this is something that's exciting to you all and something you want us to look into, we'll continue down this path. But at least wanted to bring in front of you to see what your reaction was. And then real quick, we'll do next steps and then any final input and feedback. We're going to continue, we're going to finalize the bike loop that we, the first one we have and explore other bike loops as well that are themed around, uh, like you said, fitness, entertainment, other cultural, you know, store kind of points of interest. We wanted to see if you all as the committee would like to actually go on that bike loop, go on a bike ride, and we'll have a guided bike ride and see, you know, you can experience the loop yourself. I would love to get those trip those e-bikes see if we can get a few of those out there for you to all to try out but if that's something you're into we'd like to make those arrangements before it gets too cold um, we want to continue to get feedback and writer input on these loops so inviting groups of people maybe not from dublin to go and try out our loop and see what we missed and then continue to look for other opportunities so we mentioned entertainment cultural store public art we didn't mention that but that's certainly a good one to throw in the mix, fitness, and then I threw in a public cemetery loop I thought could be fun this time of year, but that's just an example of you can do, you know, themed around the year kind of bike loops. Now count me in on the on the tour, make it Saturday or Sunday, and I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, I mean, I'm all... Owns Trucker City somewhat a blue zone without maybe paying the fees, but <clears throat> part of a successful blue zone is healthy people that are in shape. And uh, you just saw Mackie, the guy that runs uh, Whole Foods, was on uh, on a business station uh, talking about uh, COVID and you know really how many of these people are dying because they really aren't in shape. Seventy three percent of the Americans are overweight. Forty two percent are considered obese or something. So, I mean, you know, if you really care about your citizens, you're really working on all this outdoor stuff to have them, you know, yes, they have the personal choice of not going out and running or walking or working out. That's every citizen's right. But, you know, we have been really way well, overly religious in trying to make sure that that opportunity was available to our, all our citizens, that there's bike trails, exercise pods for them, for their children. Um, so, I mean, you know, the noble thing to do is for us, the city council people, is to make sure these opportunities exist for the citizens and they may or may not take them, but to try to do everything we can to encourage them because this adds to the longevity of them and uh, actually, the, you know, the overall health and enjoyment of their last, you know, maybe their years from 50 to, to 90 if they get out and they're in good shape. But, you know, Americans are notoriously overweight and and... <laughs> and have bad diets and uh anything we can do to try to mend that to add that extra few years and quality of life to uh their lives is really and always has been like one of our hallmarks um and i think i think jamie's saying in zoning where if you come in for zoning you have to give up x amount of your land and that was initially done in the 1980s or whenever so that there'd be a pocket park some people could push their baby carriages to and then if we already had a pocket park for them uh that extra residual land was put into a larger thing for like soccer field very sensitive to try to do what you guys are doing uh, just passive mobility of sitting down, but actual physical mobility of getting off your keister and getting out and burning some calories. So this is all good, guys. Thank you. Kathy, you want to add some thoughts? I'll ride with you. <laughs> Can we drink I that, together? I do that loop. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, Jen? 
and we drink together when it's over. <laughs> uh, there's a question, huh? There's a question. That's, there's those calories that you're. <laughs> Any other thoughts, Kath? Before we wrap. No, I I think that's great, and I, again, this is a relatively inexpensive way to really leverage, as John said, the infrastructure that's there. So, right. Yep. Um, I, I I would like to just on the next steps. I think the action steps you have planned are, are really good, uh, Jam and Tom, all of you. And um, one of the things that I that that struck me is I sit on planning and zoning. And John is right. We frequently get uh, development to come through and you'd be very proud of the commission because they're constantly asking, how does this connect uh, by walks or bikes? And we're getting a lot of pushback at times from people, from developers who do not want a bike path through their development or they do not want a walking path that goes in between houses. So as you make your recommendations, I would ask you to think about the recommendations you would like to make to the in planning and uh, in, in the planning department to the planning and zoning commission on how they should view developments in in cooperation with your mobility initiatives because I think that we're sometimes now that I've seen all of this I can help that but I think sometimes our commissioners are guessing as to how much they should push for connectivity. And I think we could use a little direction and maybe I'd ask you to maybe even come and have a little conversation with our commission um, to talk about how they can help move this policy forward when they view um, development opportunities that come in the city and how to work the public realm and connect the bike path. So I think that's important. Um, hey, Jane, invite yeah. her to the bike ride. Oh, I'm going. I'm going to. Oh, yes, we'll invite them to the bike ride. That's a good idea if you'd like the commission members to. Uh, that would be a good time to talk. Well, I don't know how many commission members can. Well, we'll talk to legal about that. I guess they can. If we're not talking about any applications and we're just talking, doing a bike ride and talking about connectivity, I think that's fine. Um, yeah, so, uh, Jam, do you have any other, any other slides to show? Uh, just real quick, uh, they're very quick. It's um, update on completing smart streets. So let's, I'll power through it real quick. Go ahead. We want to just remind you that you did pass a complete streets resolution in June 2018. And then Dublin again, or council again passed a resolution in support of Morpsey smart streets policy in October of last year. And this is for staff to consider and incorporate smart street technologies wherever it's feasible. So an example of that would be the smart intersections project. Some a long term policy consideration that I want to put on all of your radars right now is a vision zero policy for the city. So we, you know, we need to meet internally and figure out if this is the best way forward for the city. But um, it's something that Columbus is doing, something that Morpsey and ODOT are pushing. So we want to be up with the times and figure out if it's vision zero is appropriate for our community if you'd be supportive of such an initiative. What is Vision Zero? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vision first Zero. Of all, tell me. I'll give you 30 seconds. Vision okay. Zero started in Sweden in 1997 and it's really meant about it's it's focused on minimizing fatalities and serious injuries as it relates to uh, transportation and mobility. So that can be a design solution. It could be policy solutions, like lowering speed limits, um, things of that nature. It's meant to be a holistic approach to the mobility system and any uh, opportunities for safety improvements. We do, I think, a lot of that already in Dublin, but this is a very much a program that has its own parameters and its own way of looking at the system. So if it makes sense for our community, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to have those meetings and discuss that but at least wanted to put on your radar to maybe research it this evening or until the next meeting and see if it's something that would make sense. For the next steps, we have to continue with Morpsey. We lean on them for these policies at a regional level. So we wanna continue doing that and uh, provide that to you all. So that's all I have for, um, I'll just jump to the last slide is any final input and feedback regarding the priority areas and I already got your interest on the bike ride. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of interested in back on the smart streets because I brought this up when we were talking about Franz Road. 
Uh, what, what's the thinking on the smart streets about dedicated bike lanes on arterial roadways? Uh, yeah, we talked about that. That I mean, that's part of the smart streets. So uh, what's the thinking? And I know, um, uh, I know we've talked about it in there and they're looking at it. I don't know if that's something transportation department or. I would like to punt this to one of my <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> Hello, and Jeannie can um, yeah. follow up on what I will share, but the bike lane or the concept of bike lanes would fall more under our complete streets policy. And we do consider dedicated bike lanes. Um, one example where we are incorporating dedicated bike lanes within the roadway is on um, University Boulevard, which we will be taking to construction early next year. So we absolutely look for opportunities to incorporate dedicated bike lanes. Um, the Spark Streets part of it is more geared towards the technology implementations. Um, Jeannie can add more details on either of those if you'd like. Sure. Um, so Jane, you were asking specifically about France Road. And we are looking at the um, alternative transportation lane. Um, we are getting close to wrapping up that report. Um, there are um, some suggestions and recommendations on how to proceed with that. Um, that may or may that don't necessarily include infrastructure. Um, it would really um, be more in terms of code and making accommodations in code to be able to accommodate um, our micro transit type vehicles, um, which is a, a really great first step. And then also to um, look at some potential um, ways to incorporate um, micro transit on our sidewalks and shared use paths and piloting that along France Road and seeing how that is used and how it actually functions so that when we write code, um, the code is appropriate and matches what the needs of the community are. Uh, I, I, that makes perfect sense. I think the thing that I, I can't help but wonder as we look forward, if we're really, really successful in getting people to use alternative transportation uh, with bikes or e-bikes or scooters mm -hmm. or gosh knows, I mean, there's all kinds of transportation vehicles that we haven't even imagined yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I wonder then, you know, will we overrun our sidewalks and and our shared path uses, especially in the areas that are high traffic? Uh, I mean, I can see it now in historic Dublin where we're having to think about taking the bike paths off the places that it originally was to circumvent all the pedestrian traffic. And I just want to make sure that we're thinking far enough into the future that if we're really successful in this initiative, do we have the space to put all these wheels? Right, and that's I think that's a fair comment. What That's what we were trying to um, allude to with how does it work and how does it fit in our community and how to write that code so that it is appropriate for our community. Hopefully that we are you know, very successful in this endeavor. So that's why we want to test it and see how it actually functions and how we should proceed. So, right. yep. Right. And I, and I would throw this out really quickly. I have, you know, a golf cart. I live in historic Dublin. I could easily make it street ready, but in all honesty, I don't know how feel, how safe I would feel in mm -hmm. regular traffic, right? Right. So and those little e-vehicles, those little small things that are coming in the future, they're, they're no doubt coming, is where yeah. maybe we don't have bikes and, and scooters in this multimodal lane, but maybe we have other electric vehicles mm -hmm. that are smaller, that are just right. going to the grocery store or down for lunch or just to a hardware store. That's ideally would be wonderful. But I just yeah. don't, don't know how you accommodate that, but it's worth throwing out that question. Yeah, those are the things that we definitely considered in um, the France Road Alternative Transportation Lane Study. Um, and I don't want to, you know, get into the details of that study because right. it will derail this entire conversation. And I want to keep it focused on the mobility and the great work that JM has been doing here. Um, but, you know, in order to make those accommodations right now, um, significant um, 
physical infrastructure would have to be put in place that is probably cost prohibitive while we still have the um, mode shift that we have. Right. So that's why we're looking at potentially other solutions incorporating code changes to allow these um, types of vehicles um, on our shared use path system and on our sidewalks. I gotcha. I see what you're saying. That makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. Well, unless there's any other comments, and do you feel, GM, and, and all of you that you have um, a direction? That we've, the, the only thing that I see that we've added, uh, Kathy asked definitely for technology to be incorporated in anything that you're going forward with to, to make the best use of that, um, that, that, that your plans are done cooperatively within departments. So if you, I, I know I mentioned that, if you have a big initiative next spring that we incorporate the excitement of, of getting all the wheels on the streets. Um, I mentioned about the, the path clearing for the winter as is something that we need to talk about at council. Are there other things that were in addition to your next steps group here that we need to uh, to give the to sort of summarize? Hey, uh, Jane, I, I think you're right. Hey, Jane, your idea about. Um, uh, JM and uh, and uh, Ryan and these guys talk to uh, uh, the planning department about this. You know, what's to be expected, bicycle trails, how important they are. Um, you know, those guys and gals who serve on that aren't really urban planners. They're not really landscape architects. And any kind of information you can pour their way to keep them aware of every zoning that comes in and how they should address it and what they should think about uh, related to uh There's anything you guys could do to uh, do a presentation and just talk to them. This is all about educating people to a higher level and getting them prepared for their jobs. So, really important that um, you know a lot of people that we point are, you know, this ain't Germany or someplace where you got to be a land planner or something to get on a planning and zoning board. We have anybody across the sun, or across the. Uh, uh, the horizon they're serving on these things so uh they all need to be educated in in uh, all these all these things that would make them uh, yeah. more effective so i think that's an excellent for that. So, uh, that would be great if you could if we could talk to jenny about doing that yep, uh, yep. anything else we're missing kathy anything else we missed there were quite a few little things but i think they all got captured along the way so good thank you thanks yeah. to the team for thank you. Uh, it's important work. It is. Yep. Yes, thanks yep. for all the feedback. This is great. Good. Great, Jam. Thank you, Jeannie, and everybody that's on, Megan. All right, have a good evening. This meeting is Thank adjourned. you. Thank you. Yeah, bon appetit. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.